If you haven't watched any of my earlier videos, you might find this a little hard to follow. Please make sure you uh, follow some of the suggested links to, uh, to see earlier videos in which I explain some of the relevant concepts. So we're going to suppose that the electorate, the group of people whose preferences we're trying to turn into a social uh, welfare function, or turn to a social ranking, um, can be broken into three groups. There is segment one, and segment one is potentially a very large group of people indeed. There's really no limit on how big it could be. So imagine that's millions of people. Segment two is another very large group of people, and segment one and segment two, they differ crucially over the relative ranking of options A and B. And Jack is just a single voter, and Jack turns out to be a pivotal voter on the issue of A and B. So given that all the segment one people agree one way on A versus B, they tend to prefer B over A. I'm going to write that in now. So here's the, the segment one preferences. I think B first, then C, then A. And segment two thinks A first, then B, then C. So notice segment one, B is ranked higher than A, and segment two, A is ranked higher than B. Well, whichever way Jack goes, that's the way it's going to be in the overall social choice ranking. And it's uncontroversial that it must be possible under any voting rule that you'll have some situation like this where somebody turns out to be a pivotal voter. And what we've done is we've just split up the population to identify that pivotal voter, and we've called him Jack. So here are Jack's preferences. He thinks A is better than B is better than C. Now, using what we know about how social uh, the social preference um, uh, preference function, the social welfare function, must be structured, what could we fill in about uh, the social ranking from this? So let's make some notes about the social ranking over here. One thing we can note is that everybody prefers B over C. And one of the expectations of a social welfare function is that it respects unanimity. So given that there is unanimous agreement that B is better than C, that's what we're going to put in the overall social ordering. What else can we put in? Well, remember we said Jack is decisive on the pair A versus B. So although it's a controversial matter, A versus B, by design, we put in that Jack would be able to tip the balance on that. And on this one, we know it's unanimity. Finally, we also know that transitivity is going to be a feature of our social welfare function. And we've got A is better than B, and B is better than C. So by transitivity, A must also be better than C. So you could write it out as, sorry, not that, as A is better than B is better than C, is the overall social ranking. Good. Let's now move to the second stage. And let's suppose the only thing that changes here is Jack changes his mind about that crucial pair A and B. So for this group, it's still B beats C beats A. For this group, it's still A beats B beats C. But now Jack thinks B beats A beats C. So let's fill in the social function, uh, social welfare ranking again. First, by the fact that Jack changed his mind, we now know that B will be better than A. Okay, it's by the fact that Jack is the pivotal voter. Second, another one of the features, as well as unanimity and as well as transitivity, another one of the features that we want in a social ranking is independence of irrelevant alternatives. That means when any two options are 
were ranked in a given way in one set of preferences, if you don't change the preference between that pair of options at all, then you should get the same ranking. And so regarding the pair A and C, there should be no change because no one changed their mind about the relative goodness of A and C. So we can fill in A better than C by the I, I, A, that stands for independence of irrelevant alternatives. And again, then we can use transitivity because if B is better than A and A is better than C, then by transitivity, B must be better than C. So we now get this ranking, B, A, C. Okay, final stage. What happens now? Now, Jack's votes stay the same, his preferences stay the same, but we're going to change both segment one and segment two, and they're both going to reverse their opinion on the pair B and C, and leave everything else unchanged. So we get C, B, A, Jack is the same, B, A, C, and segment two is the same except for C and B, A, C, B. What is our social welfare function? Well, first let's lock in. Remember the only things that changed were C and B preferences. So A and C should be the same as they were before, again, by the independence of irrelevant alternatives. What about B and A? Well, also B and A preferences didn't change. Okay, So before B was preferred to A, they're still preferred to A by segment one. B was preferred to A by Jack, they're still preferred to A by Jack and A was preferred to B by segment 2, and it's still A is preferred to B by segment 2. So whatever the ranking was between A and B before, and it was this, B is preferred to A, you should still get the same thing. B preferred over A, so that's also by I, I, A. And then you can use transitivity again. B is better than A, A is better than C, so we know B is going to be ranked better than C by transitivity. So what's our overall ranking? It's in fact the same as before, B beats A beats C. So you might think that's not such a problem, is it, if it doesn't change from before. But now note what has happened here. Okay? All of these people in segment one prefer C over B. All of the people in segment two prefer C over B. And as I mentioned, it doesn't matter how many people are in these groups. It could be millions and millions of people. There is, in fact, only one person in the entire population who ranks B as better than C, and yet that preference carries the day. B gets ranked better than C. So, in effect, Jack has become a dictator. His preference on this particular pair dictates the preferences of the social ranking. And indeed, if Jack changed his mind on B and C, he, he flipped them around in some way, well then you would have unanimity again, and so unanimity would dictate that C must be ranked better than B. So it's all down to Jack. If he goes one way, the social ranking would be B above C. If he goes the other way, it'll be C above B. Even though no one else in the entire population has changed their mind. In fact, even though in this particular case, everyone prefer has the opposite preference from him. That's what it means to be a dictator. So we've shown if you have a social ranking, uh, a social welfare function that respects the properties of, let's, let's uh, clear the decks here and summarize what we have. Whoops. If you're, you're um, your social welfare function respects unanimity, uh, the independence of irrelevant alternatives,
and transitivity. Then someone can be a dictator. It won't always happen, but there are possible preference configurations whereby it can happen. And that seems an unacceptable outcome, you might think. That's really the key idea underlying Arrow's proof, or the key un under, uh, strategy I'm trying to show you that he uses to show the sort of the necessary evils that come with any social welfare function. You can't have a perfect democratic vote voting method.